Welcome everyone to our webinar today. Uh, those who have Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, a wonderful and interesting word. Uh, and we are joined by Dr. Samar Issa, consultant hematologist and clinical head of the lymphoma service at Middlemore Hospital. And just a wonderful lady overall. She's pretty cool. So we'll hand the time over to you, uh, Dr. Summer. Uh, and we have uh, let's see, 10 attendees on at the moment. Oh, thank you very much, Tim. Um, and thanks to Leukemia Blood Cancer New Zealand uh, for inviting me to talk about Waldstrom's macroglobulinemia this morning. Um, welcome everyone to this um, webinar. Um, I am intended to talk um, for around 40, 45 minutes. Hopefully we will have enough time to answer your questions afterwards. Um, we already have a couple of questions, so you either um, email them or uh, put them in the chat box and we will try to address all of them at the end of the um, webinar. So, um, Wolderstrom macroglobulinemia, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, let us start by talking about the history and where did that name uh, come from? Uh, in 1944, Dr. Jan Wolderstrom, a Swedish uh, doctor, described two patients um, with mouth and nose bleeding, and also they had enlarged lymph nodes. They both had hyperviscosity syndrome, and you will hear about hyperviscosity uh, throughout my talk. It's increased thickness of the blood. So that was documented uh, using an Ostwald viscometer, and this is what it looks like, a very simple uh, uh, machine or apparatus. And Walderstrom recognized that these patients had a disorder that distinct from myeloma. And the cells in their bone marrow, they don't look like myeloma cells at all. And the patient's serum subsequently was analyzed using an ultracentrifuge and found to contain a component with a sedimentation coefficient of 19S and a very high molecular weight of over a million. So Walderstrom postulated that this component, the 19S, was a preformed giant molecule rather than an aggregate of small molecules or small subunits. And he called this 19S molecule macroglobulin. So what is a macroglobulin? A macroglobulin is a very big protein, a globulin with a very high molecular weight. Three most prevalent um, types, alpha-2 macroglobulin that's secreted from the liver, IgM or immunoglobulin M, which is the one that contributes to Waldstrom macroglobulinemia, and cryoglobulin that is created from the liver or the plasma cells. So elevated levels of macroglobulin is called macroglobulinemia. And that is the name of this subtype of lymphoma, Waldstrom's macroglobulinemia. Alpha-2 macroglobulin can be elevated in liver disease, uh, kidney disease, like nephrotic syndrome, diabetes, and severe burns, uh, while IgM is elevated in Waldstrom macroglobulinemia. So where does this IgM that causes Waldstrom macroglobulinemia come from? It comes from plasma cells or lymphoplasmacytic cells. These are white blood cells that originates in the bone marrow as B lymphocytes. And I will elaborate a little bit further about it in a couple of slides. 
Subsequently, these B lymphocytes migrate from the bone marrow where they are born to the lymph nodes. They get exposed to the antigen there to get educated and be told to produce large quantities of protein that is called antibodies in response to foreign bodies, viruses, and other microbes that our body gets exposed to. So these cells are our defense system. They are our protectors. And immunoglobulin M or IgM is the antibody that is formed initially in response to the exposure to the antigen. So it's our first antibody that is secreted by those lymphoplasmacytic cells. It's also the initial antibody that is formed after the primary immunization. Then once these cells are exposed, they secrete the IgM, they learn what to do, they become more mature and turn into full plasma cells that secrete IgG and IgA. So that's the second stage of the maturation or the development of these plasma cells. And then they migrate from the lymph nodes back to the bone marrow where they were born and they become long lived plasma cell, settled there in the bone marrow, ready to produce the IgG and the IgA when needed to. So, Waldstrom macroglobulinemia is a subtype of lymphoma. These are the Waldstrom cells with all the IgG vacuoles inside of them. But what is lymphoma, you may ask? Lymphoma is cancer of the lymphatic system. This is the WHO classification of all the subtypes of lymphoma, including B cell lymphomas, T cell lymphomas and Hodgkin lymphoma. There are aggressive subtypes of lymphoma and indolent or low grade lymphomas. Waldstrom macroglobulinemia, also known as lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, is a subtype of the mature or indolent B cell neoplasm. And it sits here. So why do you have so many types of lymphomas? These subtypes arise because of the journey of the lymphoid cells that I told you I'll elaborate on. And here it is. So our lymphoid cells are born in the bone marrow. And depending on where the transformation from a normal lymphoid cell into a malignant cell or the mutation happens throughout the journey of that lymphoid cell from its birth until its maturation and then back to the bone marrow. That's what makes lymphoma have those so many subtypes. If the transformation happens, after the birth of the lymphoid cell, while still in the bone marrow, it produces acute lymphoblastic leukemia. The lymphoid cells, as I've already mentioned, they leave the bone marrow after they are born and start the journey of education and maturation and growth inside the lymphoid tissue and that is our lymph nodes and spleen, from a naive, newly born, uneducated B cell, they start getting education and activation throughout the germinal center of the lymph node until they become a mature B cell. And so if the transformation to a malignant cell or the mutation happens throughout that journey, 
inside the lymph nodes and spleen, the different types of lymphoma arises, including mantle cell lymphoma and marginal cell lymphomas, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Then as they move inside the germinal center, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, you might have heard of it, follicular lymphoma or Hodgkin lymphoma, then Burkitt lymphomas. And Waldstrom macroglobulinemia sits here. That's when the lymphoid cells, as I've already mentioned, got exposed to the antigens throughout the journey in the bone, uh, uh, in the lymph nodes, sorry, and started secreting the IgM macroglobulin. So as it is a transitioning from a lymphoid cell into a plasma cell, which is the final uh, uh, cell in this a uh, uh, journey of a growth. Lymphoplasmacytoid cell secreting IgM mutations or abnormalities in the cell happens, Waldstrom macroglobulinemia develops. I have a webinar that I given uh, this time last year to our Leukemia Blood Cancer New Zealand uh, patients about the biology of lymphoma. If you're interested in hearing more about this, please check out that uh, uh, webinar. It is available on YouTube. The most common subtype of uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma is an aggressive uh, large B cell lymphoma, which accounts for over 30% of patients, then indolent follicular lymphoma, which accounts for also around one third. All the other subtypes, including Waldstrom macroglobulinemia, are rare, and they sit around here. So as we said, Waldstrom macroglobulinemia or lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma is a type of non-Hodgkin B cell lymphoma. It's indolent in nature. Waldstrom itself accounts for the majority of lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma. There are a couple of non-secretory lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma and non-IgM paraprotein comprising the remainder. So basically, all Waldstrom macroglobulinemia patients have lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, uh, but not the other way around. They are used interchangeably in this case. It's a rare disease with an incidence of four per million per year. And Waldstrom macroglobulinemia, as we said, is, accounts for one to 2% of all non-Hodgkin lymphomas. Median age is 63 years, more common in male and more common in Caucasian people. How do these uh, uh, patients present? Uh, around quarter of patients with Waldstrom are asymptomatic, really. They just diagnose incidentally on a blood test. And sometimes it takes five, 10 years or even more uh, before patients develop symptoms that would require therapy. Typically, the initial symptoms are non-specific. Fatigue, malaise, uh, weight loss, and fever are common uh, presenting uh, symptoms uh, as well. And over time, patients might develop some related either to the uh, infiltration of those lymphoplasmacytic cells in the bone marrow uh, or the high level of IgM paraprotein. Uh, bone marrow infiltration is seen in almost all patients with Waldstrom's at presentation, and it co can cause uh, low cell counts uh, because those lymphoplasmacytic cells replace the normal bone marrow cells. So a patient can present with anemia, which is the most common presenting uh, symptoms, or low platelet count called thrombocytopenia or low uh, neutrophil counts called neutropenia. 
We can uh, see in a quarter of the patient in large lymph nodes, uh, spleen and or liver enlargement. Uh, as I said, some of the symptoms might be related to the elevated level of the IgM, which is a macroglobulin. And so symptoms can include hyperviscosity or stickiness of the blood, uh, neuropathy, uh, and hemolytic anemia related to the either cryoglobulin or cold agglutinin due to the IgM. The hyperviscosity uh, syndrome is seen in over one third of the patient and is evidenced by fatigue, dizziness, uh, sometimes the bleeding, but more importantly, abnormal eye examination, blurring of the uh, vision, hemorrhage within uh, the eye uh, also can affect the heart function. Uh, the IgM in neuropathy is more common, as in 40% of cases, uh, and uh, it's usually progressive. It affects uh, uh, the extremities, it's symmetrical, both sides uh, are affected, and it's usually a tingling sensation. And uh, uh, the uh, high uh, level of uh, globulin antibodies that are called myelin uh, uh, antibodies or anti-mags can also be found in some uh, in, in patients, uh, up to 50% of the patients, um, but they are uh, unlikely to cause major symptoms. Other rare symptoms include kidney disease in 5% of patients or rare patients could present with skin rash. And I've seen it in minority of patients, not so common. Amyloidosis, which is a um, protein, an IgM protein that sticks to each other, the pieces of the IgM and become insoluble fiber and can deposit in the heart, kidney and liver, also rarely seen. And there is a syndrome that's called bing neal syndrome. I've seen it in a couple of patients only, and that is central nervous system involvement by Waldstrom macroglobulinemia or the lymphoplasmacytic cells. Rarely seen. So how do we diagnose Waldstrom macroglobulinemia? As I said, sometimes for many years it goes undiagnosed because the patient is asymptomatic, but if a patient uh, develop uh, some tiredness, fatigue, or other symptoms, or they go for routine blood count, that can be discovered. They might have low hemoglobin, low platelet count, no, low neutrophil count. Typically, serum or protein electrophoresis to look for the IgM, or what we call the M spike here, that's the IgM here, uh, is very important tool that's available to us to diagnose the, uh, 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 this type of lymphoma. Um, also, some of uh, our patients uh, can uh, be requested to have a staging CT scan to look for enlarged lymph nodes, liver or spleen. And of course, a bone marrow biopsy is extremely important to look for these lymphoplasmacytic cells and also to determine the disease burden, which I'll explain to you shortly. This is a study that was published by Ariane et al. Uh, in 2020, and they looked at 31 patients with Waldstrom macroglobulinemia and evaluated the most common symptoms in these uh, patients, uh, the lab and the clinical symptoms. Uh, so uh, most commonly seen, uh, the stickiness of the red cells, which we call ruler formation of on a blood film. Also, the high level of the IgM here is an extremely important and common lab finding. Anemia, enlarged lymph nodes, liver and spleen are seen less often in Waldstrom patients. Hyperviscosity syndrome, as explained. 
The subtype of IgM is mostly, there are two subtypes of light chains in our immunoglobulins, uh, kappa subtype and lambda subtype. The kappa subtype is more common in more strong macroglobulin. It's actually more common in general in hematologic malignancies. And this is what trollo formation looks like. The red cells stick to each other's on a blood film, a courtesy of Dr. Anna Reskova, hematologist at Laba Plus in Auckland City Hospital, who provided me with these slides. Uh, so these are the rulers. The red cells stick to each other's because of the uh, high viscosity of the macroglobulin, increase the macroglobulin levels. And these are the lymphoplasmacytic cells seen in the peripheral peripheral blood, abnormal increase in the number of the cells. The pathology, as I said, of the bone marrow is extremely important, and it's always uh, involved, almost always involved. Um, the bone marrow biopsy uh, here, uh, and some of you might have undergone a bone marrow biopsy. We take, we put a needle uh, in the back uh, bone and the hip bone, take some uh, liquid, which is what we call the bone marrow spread, and then take a small piece of the bone, which is called a trephine biopsy. Uh, so the bone marrow spread consists of small cells, lymphoplasmacytic cells. This is almost becoming a plasma cell. It's darker, the cytoplasm is darker in the plasma cells. And then in the trephine biopsy, uh, we look at these small lymphoid cells. We stain them with different stains you might have heard your hematologist mention these stains, CD19, CD20, et cetera, just to confirm we're dealing with this subtype of lymphoma, because as you know, now there are multiple subtypes of um, lymphomas and we need to be 100% sure we're dealing with lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma and or strom macroglobulinemia by doing these stains. Uh, this is uh, an S spread. You see, this is very crowded. Uh, uh, bone marrow aspirate a fragment, and it is full of uh, lymphoblasmacytic cells crowding the bone marrow. That's why anemia happens. We don't see many red blood cells here. We don't see many neutrophils. We don't see many platelets. And again, uh, this, these are the lymphoblasmacytic cells. And this is a nice example of lymphoplasmacytic cells. Look at these little vacuoles here. We call them ducho bodies. These are the lymphoplasmacytic cells full of IgM macroglobulin riddled with it. And these are the, the stains, the special stains. So now we know that this bone marrow biopsy has lots of those cells. They are lymphoid cells, they are CD20 positive, and they are lymphoplasmacytic cells because they are CD13A positive. These are names of a special stains that help us diagnose uh, patients and confirm that they have Waldstrom macroglobulinemia. And as I explained to you earlier, we also look at the disease burden. How much of the bone marrow has normal cells, like here, and how many abnormal or lymphoplasmacytic cells infiltration. And in this case, the disease burden or the tumor burden is 40%. It's inevitable nowadays in this molecular era time um, that we talk about the molecular genetics. All cancers come from abnormal cells that have acquired some genetic changes or characteristics. We also call them mutations that render those normal cells abnormal, cause the cancer. There is a reason why these cells become cancerous. The most common genetic change in Waldstrom macroglobulinemia is a mutation that's called MyD88 gene mutation, found in 90% of the patients. 
chromosome 6 the lesions is seen in around 63% of patients. And also there is another gene alteration seen in 30% of patients is called CXCR4. These mutations are really important because the combinations of them will lead to the cell evading the self-destruction mechanism, like the MIDI88 protein mutation, help the cell to evade the apoptosis and make the cell immortal. Then on top of that, if that cell acquires another mutation, like the CXCR4 protein mutation, it helps the cell to proliferate or divide and grow. So we have a cell that's immortal, it's not dying, and then it acquires another mutation that will tick it and make it divide. And that's by definition what cancer is. Immortal cells that divide and they don't follow the rules of self-destructions because they acquired these mutations. We see it across these mutations across the board, but the MIDI88 mutation is more common in Waldstrom macroglobulinemia. We see it in other subtypes of lymphomas, but it is the whole mark of Waldstrom macroglobulinemia. And nowadays, we have the ability in lab plus molecular lab to test for the MIDI88 uh, gene mutation to confirm the presence of this mutation in our lymphoma patients. The prognosis is uh, variable in Waldstrom macroglobulinemia patients. So no two patients are the same. And the criteria that we look at or the risk factors that we look at in Waldestrom include five major important factors. Age, more than 65. Hemoglobin, less than 115. Platelet count, less than 110. A tumor marker called beta-2 macroglobulin, more than three and the serum monoclonal protein IgM of more than 70. Zero or one risk factors is a better prognostic group with a median survival of over 10 years, 142 months. If you have two risk factors or old age, more than 65, then you fall into the intermediate risk disease with a median survival of just less than 10 years of 99 months. Those who carry three or more, um, um, four or five risk factors, uh, they have a median survival of 43 months. And these are the graphs uh, that confirms that uh, this is the score, uh, zero or one, uh, with a better survival than those who have a higher score of a three or more with a lower survival here, based on data published by Morel et al. Uh, in a blood journal in 2009. And that's how the IPSS will destroy macroglobulinemia score was established. So how do we manage patients with Waldstrom macroglobulinemia? If you are asymptomatic, if the finding of the uh, uh, lymphoma was incidental, done on a, or discovered on a routine blood test done for any other cause, we're not gonna treat you. There is no advantage of treating patients who are asymptomatic. And in general, and this is really important, the level of the monoclonal IgM alone is not an indication to start treatment. I can't emphasize enough on the importance of this uh, point. 
plasmapheresis, which is thinning of the uh, hyperviscosity syndrome, the management of hyperviscosity uh, syndrome, uh, uh, can be used uh, uh, alone uh, with appropriate systemic therapy as a relief of symptomatic hyperviscosity uh, syndrome patients. The indications for therapy uh, include uh, either clinical indications or laboratory indications. So the clinical indications, it's what we call B symptoms, recurrent fevers, night sweats, unexplained weight loss, severe fatigability, likely due to severe anemia. Hyperviscosity, symptomatic hyperviscosity is an indication huge bulky lymph nodes, huge big spleen or liver are indication for treatment, severe neuropathy as well, if it is due to all the strong macroglobulinemia. As far as the lab indications concerned for the initiation of therapy, if there is hemolysis, uh, if uh, there is end organ damage like kidney impairment due to the Waldstrom, if the hemoglobin is really low, less than 100, or the platelets less than 100, or if there is uh, cardiac involvement due to amyloidosis. So how do we manage hyperviscosity syndrome? A couple of um, words on that. Plasmapheresis. What is a plasmapheresis? We reduce the stickiness of the blood by hooking the patient to a machine that makes uh, uh, exchange the uh, um, uh, blood and uh, take away uh, the macroglobulin and put the blood back so it becomes thinner and less viscous. It is effective in 80% of the patient. Uh, it's not necessary uh, that the patients undergo the plasmapheresis to the extent that the viscosity level is normal. We just want to reduce the patient's uh, um, symptoms. Um, and as I said, uh, uh, if a patient has symptoms related to the hyperviscosity, we will initiate the plasmapheresis. Otherwise, uh, there is no need to undergo this procedure. Uh, just uh, to mention, because some of you might have heard from your hematologist, that 30 to 70 percent of patients are treated with rituximab, which I will explain what it is shortly, have a transient increase in the IgM level. Uh, so we either give the first cycle of treatment uh, without the rituximab, only the other combinations of chemo, but not the rituximab, or we uh, give the patient a plasmapheresis to reduce the level of viscosity before we initiate the rituximab. Again, emphasizing here that's only in symptomatic patients, not we don't do this in patients who don't have symptoms related to hyperviscosity due to the macroglobulin. So, in general, what is the Waldstrom macroglobulinemia treatment? Different types of treatment for patients with lymphoma watchful waiting is the management approach of cho choice in asymptomatic patients. But if the patient becomes symptomatic, then we can give chemotherapy targeted therapy like monoclonal antibodies and immunotherapy nowadays emerging as a treatment for lymphoma in general, but hasn't reached the world of strong macroglobulin anemia stratosphere, hasn't been tried yet, like CAR-T treatment, if you've heard about it, them, or by specific antibodies, we don't have data in more the strong patients. Why chemotherapy works? Because the cancer cells divide faster than the normal cells. And because they divide faster, uh, the um, chemotherapy uh, target fast dividing cells at a stage, any of these stages of the cycle of growth, uh, usually the S stage, which is the synthesis, they block the cell from dividing and then the cancer cells stop growing, as simple as that. 
monoclonal antibodies are, on the other hand, are targeted therapies. They are produced in the laboratory uh, to target a specific antigens on the cancer cells. So they are designed to hook to these certain surface antigens. In our case, the CD20 uh, antibody, which is called rituximab, uh, is the most common use in lymphoma. It's the most effective. It revolutionized our treatment, first approved in 1997. So it's been around for a couple of decades. It's first line of treatment. Uh, um, in almost all the lymphomas uh, that uh, carry uh, this antigen, which is the CD20 antigens, including Waldstrom macroglobulinemia, lymphoplasmacytic cells, as we've seen earlier, are CD20 positive cells. How does it work? That's the rituximab, that's the B cell. It hooks itself to the CD20, which we've seen earlier on the B cells. Then the immune system will recognize this B cell as abnormal and start attacking it and get specifically rid of that abnormal cell. So it's extremely important tool available in our hands. First line treatment for Wolderstrom macroglobulinemia in New Zealand, a combination chemotherapy either RCD, which is dexamethasone, rituximab, and cyclophosphamide, or bendamustine and rituximab, either or. I don't have preference, both work very well. This is the data for the RCD uh, published by uh, Castritis et al. in blood 2015. 72 patients newly diagnosed Waldstrom macroglobulinemia. They were given RCD. The overall response rate is 83%. And it was very well tolerated. After seven years of follow-up, the three-year progression of free survival was uh, 45% with time to next to treatment of over 51 months. So that's an extremely uh, good results. And the median overall uh, survival was 95 months. That's eight years. And at 100 uh, months of follow-up, that's eight years of follow-up, uh, the uh, related mortality uh, to Waldstrom uh, was 20%, and the unrelated mortality, like patients died of any other cause uh, other than the lymphoma itself, was 20% as well. How about bendamustine and rituximab? This is the uh, still a trial. It's a landmark trial. Randomized patients with low-grade lymphomas, including Waldstrom macroglobulinemia, to receiving either bendamustine or rituximab or RCHOP, which used to be the standard of care before bendamustine and rituximab. And it showed patients who received uh, Waldstrom patients, sorry, that's 41 patients, that's, that's the subgroup of the study uh, uh, cohort, uh, uh, had a median uh, uh, progression-free survival of 69.5 months in comparison with just over two years in the RCHOP group. And despite statistically speaking, uh, the overall survival was similar in both the groups after 10 years of follow-up, uh, but it is edging uh, to uh, the um, uh, favor of bendamustine and rituximab. Time to next to treatment with bendamustine and rituximab was around nine years. So that is almost similar to the ones we've seen with RCD of eight years. So both of these types of a treatment, I don't prefer one uh, to the other. And um, it depends on the patient's performance status and comorbidities, whether to offer BR or RCD. Now, lots of you, this is the last part of my talk, so we will leave time for discussion, have heard of other targeted therapies 
like signal transduction pathway inhibitors, including the BCR signaling pathway inhibitors, brutin kinase inhibitors, including a brutinib, a color brutinib, and xanabrutinib, highly effective in more the strong macroglobulinemia. Why is that? We talked about the mutated pathway, and this is the mighty 88 pathway, where these genes are highly mutated, and the brutin kinase inhibitor targets those genes. It is essential uh, element of the lymphoma cell BCR signaling pathway. So blocking this pathway leads to uh, lymphoma cell death. This is a pivotal trial published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology earlier this year by Steve Treon. 63 patients with relapse refractory Waldstrom macroglobulinemia treated with single agent brutin kinase inhibitor abrutinib. 91% of patients responded, major response 79%. And with these therapies, including also with bendamustine, rituximab, and RCD, uh, in Waldstrom patients, we see this phenomenon that the response rate improves with time. So after you finish your fourth cycle or sixth cycle, we measure the IgM, we do the bone marrow biopsy to determine the bone marrow disease burden improvement after treatment. But after that point, the disease continue to regress and improve. And they found this phenomenon with a protonib as well. This is another study, a phase three trial of a brutinib plus rituximab in Waldstrom macroglobulinemia patient from the same international group. They randomized the patients, either a newly diagnosed or relapsed. So it gave us information about a newly diagnosed patients as well to either a brutinib with rituximab or rituximab alone. And we see here that the 30 month progression free survival rate with a median follow up of just over two years was 82% in the group received a brutinib with rituximab versus 28% only in the group that received rituximab only. And that's highly statistically significant result. Then they divided the groups, those who haven't been treated, newly diagnosed patients, versus those who are relapsed. And we see here the 24-month progression-free survival rate was 84% in the abrutinib rituximab group versus 59% in the rituximab alone in the treatment naive group that even was better in the relapsed refractory group, similar to the pivotal trial data with a progression of free survival of 80% in the group received a brutinib versus 22% only in the group received rituximab as a single agent. As expected, the overall survival in both the groups was similar, 94% versus 92%. And I say expected because, as you know by now, Waldstrom macroglobulinemia is an indolent low-grade lymphoma. It's treatable, not curable. The patient progress or relapse we give them second line treatment, third line treatment, et cetera. So all of the patients from the previous slides here who received single agent rituximab and to progress were rescued with other combination treatment or were given the brutin kinase inhibitor. And so their survival 
is similar to those who received abroad. My last two slides to reassure the group as well here, despite we don't have access to the Bruton kinase inhibitor in New Zealand, we quite like to have access to these targeted therapies. At the moment, we don't. We're working very hard as a group to get Pharmac to fund it for all our lymphoma patients, uh, including the Walderstrom sub subgroup. Uh, but this is the uh, international Walderstrom macroglobulinemia collaborative group recommendation for treatment of newly diagnosed Walderstrom patients in 2021. They do, they recommend doing the MIDI 88 CXCR4 genotyping. We do the MIDI 88 here. And according to the mutational status of these genes, if they are mutation, they are recommending either brutin kinase alone or in combination with rituximab as first line. But they are saying that alternatively, we can still give bendamustine and rituximab or RCD as our first line treatment in this group of patients, which is extremely assuring. So we are giving the standard of care here in New Zealand. Of course, patients with um, hyperviscosity syndrome, uh, extremely symptomatic, uh, we uh, uh, recommend initiating the plasmapheresis prior to the start of the chemotherapy or targeted therapy treatment. This is the group's recommendation for the relapse Walderstrom patients. Again, do the MID88 and the CXCR4 mutational status. And similarly, here, if we haven't given bendamustine and rituximab in the first line, we can give RCD, we can give a Bruton kinase inhibitors and so forth. So it's exactly the same combination of the drugs, excepting patients who haven't received one or the other in the first line, they can receive it in the second line, and this will apply on the third line. Of course, we always recommend enrolling our patients into a clinical trial if available. And there are some trials available to all the strong macroglobulinemia patients in this country. So please check with your hematologist. With that, I thank you very much for listening to this webinar. And I invite you to ask any questions if you have. Tim. Hey, Samad, there's uh, a few questions on the chat. Um, are you able to bring those up or would you like me yes, to read them out? Uh, for you? They are here. Cool. So uh, thank you, um, guys, for uh, listening. Uh, I have here a question uh, from Duncan with regards to the CXCR4, uh, why uh, uh, it is not tested in New Zealand. It is coming to New Zealand. It is a molecular test. Uh, we can do it. But um, to be honest, in the absence of our ability to choose the targeted therapies like a brutinib, um, uh, which is not funded here in New Zealand, uh, testing the CXCR4 will not alter the management of our patients. But I think subsequently, all of these molecular tests will be available uh, to our New Zealand patients, and we will uh, um, uh, choose the treatment based on the results of these tests, similar to the recommendation uh, from the international uh, group. Uh, there is no mention of the importance of paraprotein quantification. Uh, uh, no, uh, it is uh, important um, in conjunction with the uh, clinical presentation and the results of the rest of the blood investigations. On its own, the paraprotein level uh, should not dictate 
if the patient should start to treatment or not, unless it is extremely high. And it was in one of the slides above 70, a gram per litre. Um, but on its own, uh, it shouldn't be uh, detrimental uh, in uh, moving the patient to be treated or not. As far as monitoring the patient with the prior protein quantification, it is also uh, always tested. But as I explained, numbers do not matter in the uh, face of symptoms. And the number will continue to drop uh, months after the patients complete their uh, treatment. Uh, so paraprotein quantification is important in conjunction with other factors. Uh, Zanaprotinib doesn't have a commercial supplier in New Zealand. It is approved for use, but need to be imported from the US. Um, I can't answer that question. Uh, uh, it's not in my um ability to bring these drugs to New Zealand or not. But if you are willing to pay for the brutin kinase inhibitor, whether it's an abrotinib, a calabrotinib, or a brutinib, I think your hematologist will be able to uh, source it for you. Um, and there are a few questions on the question and answer section as well. Okay, I've seen that. Uh, CXCR, um, that's the same. We've talked about it. Um, um, I talked about, I mean, for, um, for uh, I mean, in the absence of us using a brutinib to guide, uh, uh, or it's not funded here, uh, guiding the treatment based on the CXCR for, um, um, I mean, should be done in discussion with your hematologist in this case, it's Richard. Um, I can't, I mean, IgM is very hard to measure at 70. Um, we do measure the IgM and I think it is uh, um, um, accurate enough, but if you're symptomatic and your IgM is, is 70, I think you possibly will be, would have been treated by now. Uh, and the para, unless it's specified otherwise, it is reported as a present. Yes, nowadays they've changed all of the lab tests uh, forms and they are electronic, so they are not letting us do the para protein unless it is specified. So it's become a bit of a mission to get it um, um, done, but there is a button that your hematologist can tick to order it. So that, that these are the questions from Duncan. Thank you, thank you very much, Duncan, um, for your questions. And hopefully um, I've uh, answered a few of them. Uh, then uh, with therapies like a protein kinase inhibitor, for those that respond to them, are these patients likely to keep all the strong uh, macroglobulinemia and remission long-term or does the disease still find a way to progress? It, it, as I said, these indolent lymphomas are treatable but not curable. Uh, all these graphs are bell-shaped. So you've seen, um, you know, the median, we always talk about the median of progression of free survival um, and these measure in years, but some patients will um, progress before uh, the eight years, some after the eight years, um, and there's always a second and a third line available to, um, to the patients um, when they relapse. But I mean, it's variable and we always talk in the median terms, but it's usually years. And yes, it will eventually relapse. When? I always tell my patients, I don't know when. Uh, do you think we will get a Bruton of funding uh, anytime soon? Uh, I've, we're working very hard, guys. So I am not sure that we will be, um, uh, when we will get it, but we will be getting there, I'm sure. Uh, Colleen, symptoms, not systems. Yeah, I agree. It's all to do with uh, uh, symptoms. Uh, all low-grade lymphoma patients need to be treated with symptoms, uh, if they are symptomatic for their symptoms. Hi, Claire. Uh, really nice to hear from you. And I think I'll be, we'll be catching up at one stage, I believe. Uh, uh, had BR and RCHOP, then you cannot have a gain on relapse. Not sure if I misunderstood there. Uh, 
if you'd had our chop, I won't give you another R chop because of the doxorubicin and the cardiac toxicity, Claire. But uh, with bendamustine, there are emerging data that we can re-challenge the patient with more bendamustine and rituximab if they've responded many years ago, and then we can give them BR again or RCD again or abrotinib. So we can negotiate that. These are drugs, as I said, effective. We have a patient in the department here at Middlemore that we re-challenging with bendamustine and rituximab, and they respond. So, um, unfortunately, oh, you answered my questions about life expectancy. This is a from Colleen. Do the new treatment extend life expectancy? Uh, always. Every treatment that comes into play pushes our patient into remission. Give them that extra how many we've talked about median of 60 months, that's five years or eight years, that extend uh, their uh, life expect expectancy. But there is always, and I agree with you, Colleen, uh, there is the balance between the treatment and the toxicity of this treatment, the benefit and the risks. And we always have to be um, um, careful of who to offer these treatment to, bearing in mind, you know, horrible um, symptoms and organ failure is not what we want our patients to experience in a low grade disease that is could be treatable with more gentle treatment. Um, yeah, better build the house quickly, Colleen. That's, that's, we better all do uh, what we want to do um, because no one knows what's gonna happen tomorrow. That's for sure. We have done rituximab only treatment. Would you do Benda rituximab as a second line? That's a from Christina. Uh, we prefer not to do chemo as it's safe for 80 years old. I've given bendamustine and rituximab to 80 years old. It depends on how good the 80 year old is. Uh, so legs and symptoms, maybe RCD, reducing a bit of cyclophosphamide with rituximab is still, I mean, um, you can re-give the rituximab. It's funded to 12 months after the initial treatment with reduced dose dexamethasone uh, or reduced dose bendamustine because we have levels of the intensity of bendamustine. Um, um, you know, 90 milligrams per meter square versus 70 milligrams or maybe less. So you can negotiate with your hematologist. Um, we also have received an email. Um, oh, there is another. Is it a question? And would you have time for a chat with? Uh, 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 um, yes, um, uh, possibly um, check with um, Tim. Um, yep. And um, we can we can chat about um, talking to the IWMF uh, NZF. Yet I'll, I'll be happy to be um, involved, guys, if you want me to. Um, there are questions that I received via email about COVID. Given the COVID pandemic, uh, here is a question about COVID: Are walled strong macroglobulinemia people on protein kinase inhibitor more susceptible to the disease? <laughs> Uh, no, uh, let me answer this uh, question more in more details. Do we have, it's midday now, Tim. Um, yep. So let me just quickly uh, spend, do I have a couple of minutes to spend on the COVID question? Yep. You, have a, you have a couple of minutes. Okay, um, so basically um, the uh, uh, um, a question with regards to all the strong macroglobulinemia and patients receiving immune therapy, targeted therapy, chemotherapy, 
Uh, look, guys, I mean, initially we recommended that we we wait a little bit until the reconstitution of the immune system. And that was my personal recommendation to my patients last year. But since then, and since COVID hung around for more than the one year we thought it's going to be around, and there are more emerging data about patients with hematologic malignancies receiving targeted therapies, immune therapies, chemotherapies, uh, we are recommending the COVID vaccination because even if you're, and the question was an IgG of a certain level, an IgA of a certain level, you've seen it from my talk. We have normal plasma cells in our bone marrow. They are tucked there. They are ready to produce the IgA and the IgG if they needed to. And the COVID vaccine is essential to protect us from COVID. Uh, in the normal non-immune compromised patients, the level of uh, response and antibody production might be a bit better from patients who are receiving chemotherapy and immune therapy. But nonetheless, we think based on the recent published data from this year that you will still produce antibody and that will be better you'll have better production, uh, protection than if you are not vaccinated. Um, and especially in view of the third dose and booster dose available. So please check with your hematologist, get that third dose administered, or if you qualify, rock on to um, vaccination center and get the booster dose. Uh, you will produce antibodies, you will be protected, um, maybe not as much as a non-chemo patient, but you will be protected. And of course, as the person who asked the question, the most important thing we should always remember, you know, keep the distance, wear your mask, be vigilant, sanitize your hands whenever you touch something, and uh, be careful, um, you know, when you are around very crowded people like gyms and movie theaters and what have you. Uh, Astra or the booster, we've all got the Pfizer here. The data all supports using the Pfizer. Millions and millions of people around the world got the Pfizer booster and third dose. I personally got the Pfizer, so I would recommend the Pfizer, to be honest, and it's proven to be safe and tolerable. Um, and Lastly, do hematologists to throw out NZ consult and talk? Yes, yes, yes. We have the lymphoma network of New Zealand, which I'm the founding chair. We meet once a year. We talk about how to treat our patients. We consult with each others. We talk to, to specialists from around the world. We are on board and part of international groups. You're getting the top treatment available to us here. We'd like more target treatment. We're working on it, but with BR, with RCD, these are still recommended a treatment in this country. And we work very hard as a group to provide the best care for you guys. So Tim, it's a 12 or four. Sorry, yep. we've taken a little bit uh, longer, but the questions were all valid and great. And mm -hmm. I thank you all for joining. It's wonderful to have all of you joining us today. And um, and um, I think Tim will also has recorded this talk and will put it on YouTube for future viewing or if other patients want to look at it in the future. Awesome. Uh, on behalf of Leukemia and Blood Cancer New Zealand, uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Sama Issa, for uh, your wonderful presentation on uh, Wardenstrom's uh, macroglobulinemia, and especially um, just at the end there in terms of the COVID uh, uh, vaccine and the COVID information for our patients. Uh, I know that that's a touchy subject for a lot of people at the moment and moving into the new um, COVID light, traffic light system is a bit um, stressful as well. So we thank you for that. Uh, no problem. Good it's day. my pleasure. Awesome. All right. And we hope everyone has a good day as well. Uh, and uh, your this recording will be uh, available later on on YouTube. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone, and have a lovely day.